Today on Truths That Transform. The Bible says, Woe unto him that takes the life of the innocent. Woe unto him that calls evil good and good evil. And that's exactly what we have been doing in this country. Winning for the pro-life side is not about court battles. It's not about even public opinion polls or votes on the Supreme Court. It's not even about legislation. It's really about saving babies from abortion and transforming our culture. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. We have experienced a legal earthquake in America. Nearly 50 years after the Supreme Court invented a supposed right to abortion out of whole cloth with no constitutional grounds, they reversed themselves, returning the issue to the states. On today's program, you will discover why Roe v. Wade inflicted a great evil upon our nation. And we begin with a look at the hysterical leftist attacks on the current Supreme Court for daring to defy leftist orthodoxy on abortion. The left has put sexual anarchy and the mechanisms like abortion that remove the consequences at the very center of their agenda and they have counted on the Supreme Court to help implement that agenda, which is why they're melting down over a more conservative court. Our own David Wright takes a closer look. We're outside the Supreme Court after the landmark decision that overturned Roe versus Wade and ended a woman's constitutional right to an abortion. At the Supreme Court today, an historic upheaval in a sweeping ruling that overturned a half a century of precedence, five justices ended the right of American women to choose abortion under the Constitution. After 49 years in the cruel slaughter of more than 63 million unborn human beings, the U.S. Supreme Court has finally reversed its deadly 1973 decision, Roe v. Wade, a ruling that invented a so-called right to abortion. Roe versus Wade, when it was first established, I think caught some people by surprise because many felt that it was wrongly decided and wasn't really a strong judicial um, philosophy that undergirded it. And so I think there are many people in the pro-life movement and even Americans that might consider themselves pro-choice have felt that this case has necessarily uh, needs to be overturned because it actually has been a bad precedent and is not rooted in strong uh, judicial philosophy. We've seen the, uh, the left and the pro-abortion crowd argue that uh, abortion, uh, as we understand it for the last 30 years, is settled law. Uh, nothing can be done about it. Well, there is no such thing as settled law when a court is wrong. And the Supreme Court has been wrong. By overruling Roe, the Supreme Court has finally rejected the illegitimacy of legislating through court decrees and returned us to the text of the Constitution itself. This whole issue of abortion uh, needs to be sent back to the states. The states have a lot more leeway, even under Roe, to regulate abortion than they've been allowed to up till now. And, and that would mean that this battle over abortion would now be fought out in every state around the Union. Well, I'm not surprised, I'm very hopeful. And uh, this is something that uh, Christians and pro-life Americans have hoped and prayed for. And it will be almost 50 years. That's a very long time for a horror like abortion to be institutionalized nationwide in the United States simply by a, an out of control activist court. And, and one of the things we need to note is that the court will be doing the country no favors in this. It, it will be righting a wrong, but it was the court's wrong. I believe there's actually a right to life in our founding documents. Uh, I think you can interpret that from the wording of our Constitution. And I think our Declaration of Independence, particularly the second paragraph, where it says that all men are created equal 
and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these, the right to life. Uh, I've always thought that was a remarkable thing that our founders, even before there were sonograms, understood that without the right to life, the other rights are sort of beside the point. The justice's decision to overturn Roe came by way of a 5-4 ruling in the case Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. We were really struck by this case that came out of Mississippi, the, uh, the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, for numbers of reasons. This case specifically uh, was asked by uh, the people of Mississippi to challenge uh, Roe versus Wade. I love what I heard in the oral arguments at the Supreme Court. The, the liberal justices had such an insanely weak defense. I'll give you an example. Justice Breyer talked about how, well, what about you know, law and order? We can't have law and order if we don't have stare decisis. Stare decisis is where they look at previous you know, laws and, pre and precedent and say, well, we're going to base this ruling on this precedent. Well, there have been many supremely wrong precedents, and so Justice Breyer's uh, assertion that somehow we lose law and order if we don't hold on to these precedents is nonsense. As the arguments unfolded, as Amy Coney Barrett started talking about adoption, as, as Justice uh, Roberts was asking about, well, is there any place we can draw the line other than 24 weeks, and the pro-abortion side was sort of refused to allow anything like that, uh, as Justice Kavanaugh talked about uh, previous Supreme Court precedents that have been overturned. Uh, including, uh, you know, the Supreme Court's ruling in the late 19th century that segregation is okay, uh, I began to grow more and more and more hopeful. While the court officially released its decision to overturn Roe at the end of June, an early draft of the decision was leaked to the public in the beginning of May. This sparked violent outbursts across the nation. An armed man arrested outside Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home and charged with attempted murder after allegedly threatening to kill the justice. This scary incident last night, another sign of the threat environment these justices face and of how unhinged the debate around the court has become. 18 Christian crisis pregnancy centers were firebombed or otherwise vandalized following the leaked decision. But this violence from the radical left is no surprise when you have people like Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer seemingly calling for it in broad daylight. I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. I think we're going to see hysteria from the radical pro-abortion fringe. Um, they, abortion has become a kind of religion to some in this country where it is sort of the, the, the mark of whether or not women are free and whether or not we can prosper, which is such a tragedy and injustice to see our empowerment and advancement through the lens of killing. Somehow we have to kill a child to succeed, to achieve our dreams. Um, no authentic advancement was ever won on the bodies of another, the body of another, by, by killing or harming another, especially a child, especially your child, your son or your daughter. I think it's gonna look very chaotic for a long time. Uh, for instance, Americans are gonna be able to say, well, you had a state like Oklahoma, that legislatively banned all abortions. You can look at states and, uh, you know, it's, it's very much a matter of red states and blue states. It's not absolute in the overlay, but it's, it's the closest thing to it. And uh, you're gonna see states like uh, Illinois, California, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, that, that are moving in the most liberal directions possible. And so it's like we're gonna be in two Americas on the abortion issue. While overturning Roe is a great victory for the pro-life cause, the battle for life is far from over. Several things are going to happen. N number one, uh, uh, Democrats in the, in the Congress will seek, as we've already seen, to legislate Roe. But even, even when they did that, the, the Schumer-Pelosi bill was even more radical than Roe. Uh, and, and then state by state, it's going to be an enormous battle. And it's because, of, you know, the logic of worldview works its way through. And so the logic of the pro-life position works through, thus Oklahoma. The logic of the pro-abortion argument, it, it works its way through. Thus, New York, California, where frankly, they almost pay for any abortion and, and are actually talking about paying for abortions from people out of state. So this is going to be a monumental task. It's a long faithfulness. I, I, I think uh, those of us who hold to a biblical worldview and uh, e even just the storyline of Scripture uh, are reminded of the fact 
that there are no permanent victories in this fallen world. And I think that there are going to be two responses Christians are going to be tempted to, uh, to kind of step into after Roe. One is celebration as if the battle's over, when actually the hard part is really then beginning, and, and that's convincing Americans state by state uh, that we're going to have to uphold the dignity and sanctity of every life. I think there are also uh, some real dangers that Christians, after Roe v. Wade, is, uh, is reversed, and then abortion's not over coast to coast. They think, what were we fighting for all these years? And, and so I have to worry about Christians who are uh, overly elated as if the battle's over, and those who will be, I think, you know, quite genuinely depressed because there's a long battle ahead. Killing a child at any age is wrong, uh, but to empower the state to protect at least more babies um, is a step in the right direction. I'm gonna to work to make sure that all 50 states get rid of abortion, but it's okay if states are different. That's how things have always been in America, that we didn't have a national law that imposed a national position on everybody on every issue. Uh, nations fracture when you do that because people are different. I mean, it's a huge country. And the idea that you know, people living in the Mountain West are gonna be the same as people living in Rhode Island, well, it's just, you, you can't expect that. And our founders didn't expect that, even in a small, smaller territory. And, and so that, that's, that's an important part for people to understand. And the left doesn't, doesn't like that idea. They, they want people to conform to their ideology. They are not for freedom of religion. They are not for freedom of conscience. They are not for freedom of anything. What they are for is the freedom for them to impose on you what they think is best. That's their freedom. It's really important for the, those of us that believe in the sanctity of life to do everything we can to build a culture of life. And there are a number of ways of doing that. Maybe one of the most important things of all is to teach our daughters and our granddaughters that to be a successful modern woman, you do not have to buy in to the idea that you should destroy your unborn child. That, that's a horrible thing, but that's something that a lot of young women are being taught, that they can't fully reach their dreams and be all that they want to be as a young woman unless they fight for this right to abort their babies. That's really an evil thing for our daughters and granddaughters to be taught. And as parents and grandparents, we can overcome that. From the Kennedy Collection Library, we'd like you to have A Nation Worth Fighting For by Dr. D. James Kennedy. Is this nation worth fighting for? Is it worth my dying for? We'll send you this gift-size hardcover book at no cost or obligation to you. Just call or write to us today asking for the book A Nation Worth Fighting For to get this valuable and inspiring resource for yourself. Of course, it's unthinkable that the founders intended a right to commit abortion that appears nowhere in the Constitution. But because the left became accustomed to the Supreme Court inventing rights for them, they often bypass persuading people and passing laws altogether, simply relying on courts to do their bidding. That's all changed now, which is why you see such panic on the left. But the court never had grounds for declaring abortion a right to begin with. It was an act of moral blindness that has stained America ever since. Dr. D. James Kennedy explains why, in this portion of his message, thou shalt do no murder. Some of you may work on your genealogies. I have never gotten into that. But in case you are and you've gotten so far back, let me give you a little help this morning. I want to talk about one of your relatives. He was the first person born on this planet. And he was a murderer. Don't omit him from your list of relatives. His name, of course, was Cain. The second person born on this planet was a murder victim. And he, of course, was Abel. And 
to demonstrate the depths to which man had fallen through the sin of Adam, this condition continued to worsen until we are told that the earth was filled with violence so that God gave up on the human race and decided to wash the whole thing clean and start over again. And that he did, of course, through Noah and his family. And when the flood had abated and dry land was seen again, he gave to them three commandments. One of those in Genesis 9, 6, where it says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Now God was obviously so concerned about the destruction of those creatures made in his image that he gave this universal law. It was not given to Jews or to any particular group. It was given to the entire new world and has never been countermanded. And yet, when we come in the 20th chapter of Exodus to the Ten Commandments, we read in the beginning of the second table of the law in our relationships to one another, these four simple, single, syllabled words. Thou shalt not kill. Now it's interesting, I think, that in Hebrew, there are about nine Hebrew words for killing. Moses passed over all of those except one, and that one is ratzach, which means murder. Always means murder. He passed over eight other words that mean to kill, to slaughter, to sacrifice, to slay, usually talking about animal sacrifices. But here he comes to the word murder, which means, therefore, that the text should be translated as it is translated in almost every modern English translation of the Bible, thou shalt do no murder. We read something from the previous book, Genesis, which was given a command given by God right after the flood, where he said, whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Because man, by the way, unlike a chicken or a pig, is the only creature made in the image of God and therefore is of extreme value. Are you not of more value than these, said Christ, referring to the birds of the air? There it says that man is to, to shed the blood of murderers, that murder is such a grievous sin because it is an attack upon those things that are made in the image of God. It is indirectly an attack on God himself. So what does thou shalt not kill mean? Does it mean that if a person has been convicted of a capital crime and has murdered somebody else, that we can wave a placard saying thou shalt not kill and they are pro prohibited from doing so? It's not waiting till the final judgment, but it is to be done by man. He has slain another person made in God's image and he has forfeited his own. So it does not apply there. Well, how about abortion? Is that a violation of the law or not? I remember one time years ago, I spoke on the subject of abortion and a couple from up north came out the door and said to me, I had just said that abortion was wrong, contrary to the scriptures, and they said, I assume therefore that you do not believe in capital punishment if you are pro-life. I said, uh, au contraire, in fact I do believe in capital punishment. He said, you're not consistent. I said, oh really? Well, let me ask you, do you believe in abortion? He said, absolutely, it's a woman's right. And I said, do you believe in capital punishment? They said, absolutely not. I said that it seems to me that the difference between the two of us is very simple. I believe in sparing the life of the innocent and taking the life of the guilty Whereas you believe in taking the life, killing the innocent, and sparing the guilty. 
But the Bible says, woe unto him that takes the life of the innocent. Woe unto him that calls evil good and good evil. And that's exactly what we have been doing in this country. We have been condemning the innocent and sparing the guilty. And that God is most definitely not pleased with. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. The kind of clear thinking you just heard from my dad is in short supply today. He understood what the Bible teaches, that there is no contradiction to being pro-life and pro-capital punishment. Both uphold the immeasurable sanctity of human life. Abortion is evil because it kills an innocent life. And capital punishment is sometimes necessary because life is so valuable that we impose the greatest possible penalty on those who casually snuff it out. What's incredible is that we have had Supreme Courts in the past who have had a completely opposite view and made it law for all of us. It's no wonder human life has been extremely devalued. But thankfully, things are changing. With the momentous events at the Supreme Court this year, we must look to what happens next. We have a new short booklet that is essential reading in our current historical moment. It's Thinking Clearly After Roe, a five-part strategy moving forward by John Stemberger. And we'll send it to you as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. Imagine a nation without abortion, a nation where each precious life is truly cherished, where children are given a chance to breathe their first breath, and where moms and families are offered hope and healing, not death and darkness. In the post-Roe world, we Christians can help set a vision like that for America. Find out how it can happen and what each of us can do to help in the compelling booklet, Thinking Clearly After Roe, a five-part strategy moving forward by John Stemberger. And if you're able to give a donation of $40 or more, we'll send you the booklet plus the DVD of Francis Schaeffer's Christian Manifesto. Schaeffer was one of the greatest and most prophetic Christian teachers of the 20th century. And in 1982, my father invited him to Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale to deliver this defining message. It has stood the test of time and remains one of the most powerful messages you will ever see. Francis Schaeffer, like my dad, understood the times because he applied the Bible to the culture around him. This thundering wake-up call on the threat posed by an overreaching government, delivered only two years before Dr. Schaeffer's death, carries even more power 40 years later. This message needs to be seen by your pastor, your Sunday school class, your children and grandchildren. We'll send you the Christian Manifesto DVD along with the booklet, Thinking Clearly After Row, a five-part strategy moving forward by John Stemberger as thanks for your generous donation of $40 or more. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339 or call toll-free 877-962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. On the day of the Dobbs case challenging the supposed right to abortion was argued at the Supreme Court, I had the opportunity to sit down with former Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant, who signed the law banning abortion after 15 weeks that was at issue in Dobbs. Here's an excerpt of that conversation. Governor Bryant, thank you for uh, joining me today. We're in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, while the Supreme Court um, hears arguments regarding legislation that you passed while you were the governor of the great state of Mississippi. And the, the legislation bans abortion after 15 weeks. Uh, up until this point, uh, this country has been governed by Roe v. Wade, uh, abortion on demand in all 50 states in the union. So why is today, as the Supreme Court hears these arguments, why is it so significant? Well, I think so many things came together. Um, I was listening to the arguments this morning, and 
one of the judges was saying there shouldn't be any political pressuring on the, on the Supreme Court, and I had to smile because how many court cases has activist judges been a part of because what was politically popular at the time? Or how many bad decisions have they made? The Supreme Court once ruled in the Dred Scott case that human beings were property. And so, yeah, they've made really bad decisions that had to be turned around. They once ruled that, that there was a right of the states to prevent suffrage of women. So they were saying, well, yeah, you can stop women from voting in African Americans. And so they had made bad decisions, and they made a bad decision in Roe v. Wade in 1973. There is just simply no authority in the Constitution to prohibit states from regulating abortion. And, of course, those of us of faith, there's a great argument. I heard uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, question our Consul General this morning, our, our, our Solicitor General, and, and say it, and it's a question of your faith and your religious beliefs. Well, it has to be. Uh, it, 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 those of us or people of faith believe that we are ordained to go and protect the innocent. Governor Bryan, I often tell my people at Coral Ridge that we are saved as individuals and we're, our faith is deeply personal, but it's never to remain private. We are called as Christians to live out a public faith, regardless of what God has called you to or where God's called you. As a man of faith, how have you lived out your faith and how has your faith informed you? Your, your faith gives you strength in, in times of challenge when you believe that you are failing, when you don't believe that you are prepared to take on these great challenges of the day. It is the faith in God, it is that small voice within your heart that telling you, I am with you. Uh, and, and I will always be there with you in the most difficult of times. So. As, as the world uh, um, seems to be attacking you, as you hear those demonic voices that says, you can't do this, leave this alone, don't make a public profession of your faith. In politics, as soon as you do that, the media is going to target you, so it's much easier to stay quiet. Um, you must find your voice, and the Holy Spirit is the only thing in this universe that will do that for you. Well. I just want to thank you. Uh, you have been a champion, continue to be a champion for religious liberty, for the sanctity of human life, and we're praying for you and uh, for all the leaders that are continue to champion this cause, especially for uh, the most vulnerable, the unborn. Thank you so very, very much. As we've seen in recent days, God indeed blesses the long-suffering faithfulness of his people. We have so much to be thankful for in America, and there is much more yet to be done. D. James Kennedy Ministries will be standing for truth and defending your freedom. And we invite you to join us as we do. Make sure to check out our vast library of digital content at djkm.org. And also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We want to hear from you. You can also find a great wealth of stuff there and more every day. I'm Pastor Rob Pacienza. Thank you for being with us. And here's a look at the next Truths That Transform. There is no more basic question than who is a human being and who deserves to be uh, a life protected, preserved, a life that possesses dignity and sanctity. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.